All right, if you open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we've been doing an overview of Paul's epistles, and right now we are in, uh, we are at the judgment seat of Christ here, and uh, last Sunday we, of course, didn't have this study because we had our annual, the Slidell Louisiana Bible Conference. Uh, for all those who attended, it was very good, and if you didn't, um, if you didn't get a chance to watch some of those messages or you want to watch them again, uh, they're on my YouTube channel now. I sent out a link to people on my email list. Uh, so that's, uh, it has all eight messages there. And it was a real, real good study. I had a real good time last weekend. And I hope you did as well. Um, while we were doing that last Sunday, Rodney, who is a pastor of a Grace Church, Right Division Church in Connecticut, he did a study on the judgment seat of Christ. And he said that that is for Israel. It's not for the body of Christ. This is a departure from what uh, right division pastors have taught, what I teach as well. And, uh, and so a couple people have asked me about that, what I think about it. My understanding is that there are a lot of people who listen to me who also listen to Rodney. And so... You know, they want to know what, what I have to say about the judgment seat of Christ. And I thought, well, uh, I'll go ahead and, and comment on that as well, since uh, that's what we're talking about anyway. You know, if, if he didn't do that study, uh, we'd still be talking about the judgment seat of Christ today. So, <coughs> what I'm going to do today is we're going to go over the scripture, see what the scripture says, tell you what the judgment seat of Christ is all about, and then... Uh, then I'll go through what Rodney said and we'll comment on, on that. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, since we didn't have our Paul's Epistles overview studied last week, there's been a, a week off there. What I'm going to do is um, do just a little bit of review because we need to understand the context of where we are. We're, we're starting in verse 11 of chapter 3 and talking about the judgment seat of Christ. But in order to we need to understand what the context is of that. Uh, what we've learned so far in uh, chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So he says there that the Corinthians are behaving just like unbelievers. And in fact, they're a little worse when you get down to chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So, not only are the Corinthians carnal, and they're acting just like unbelievers, but we also see from chapter 5, they're doing some things that are even worse than what your typical good old boy uh, who is an unbeliever just living life and trying to do the best he can, uh, the Corinthians are doing worse than them in some areas. And so because of that, Paul goes over really the implications of their actions. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Um, when what he's basically saying is, and you'll hear this whenever you tell somebody that you believe in eternal security or uh, you know, a church teaches eternal security. The main criticism of that, they'll say, oh, well, that's just easy believism. You're just saying that as an excuse to do whatever sin you want to do. And um, that's really what the Corinthians were doing. Uh, they figured, well, they're eternally secure in Christ. They can do whatever they want to do. I mean, you see there in chapter 5, verse 1, the person who is committing fornication with his father's wife. I mean, even that's not even really accepted among unbelievers, the heathen, the atheists. They're not going to be with their father's wife. Um, and, but yet in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 5, 2, it says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So not only are they doing such heinous sins such as this, but they're going around and bragging about it. Obviously, then, they are using their fleshly mind, and they're using 
their eternal security as an excuse to do whatever heinous sin they want to do. And so what Paul is doing then in the context is he is talking about the judgment seat of Christ so that they recognize that, yes, they have eternal life and there's nothing they can do to lose it. But that's not why God saved you. God didn't just save you to give you eternal life and then you can just do whatever you want to do in heaven. God is love. Those who watched the children's study this morning, we talked about this. God, the reason God saves you is because He commends His love to you. And then His desire is for you to share His love in heaven for all eternity. So it's not just, oh, well, you do, I save you, so now you can do whatever you want. And, you know, I'll let you run free and fly around and do whatever you want to do in heaven. That's not why God saved you. God saved you so that in heaven you could share His love. And how do you do that? You know, you have to have some knowledge to know how to share God's love. I've heard that there was a story of, and I don't remember the details, but it was some TV program and in Detroit, Michigan. This is just after a lot of the, um, the auto workers had lost their jobs and uh, really bad financially. There are a lot of these houses that were basically given away. You know, you could get it for next to nothing. And there was this homeless couple. And so the people, there was, on this show, what they did was they bought the house, fully paid for it, and gave the house to this couple. So now they were homeless, so now they could live in the house. And yet, I think a year later, and maybe not even that long, um, the house was, um, they lost the house. You think, well, how can you lose it? You don't owe anything on it. Well, I don't know exactly what they did, but they weren't, they didn't know how to use money properly. So even though they had a house paid off, maybe they didn't pay their light bill or they didn't pay their water bill or maybe they took a mortgage out on it and used the money to you know, buy a boat or who knows what, what they did. Um, but the point is, you just give them a house and yet they still lose the house because they don't know how to use it. See, you could think of that in terms of God giving us love. He gives us love and He gives us heaven. He gives us eternity in heaven, and we can't lose that. But if we don't know how to share His love to others, what good is it? You know, what good? It wasn't any good for that couple in Detroit to get a house freely given to them, no debt whatsoever, fully paid off. They ended up losing it because they didn't know how to manage their finances appropriately so that they could keep the house. And so you can think of God's love like that. God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God gives us His eternal life. He gives us His love. He gives us eternal life. But it's not just, okay, now you're in heaven and do whatever you want. God expects us to grow in sound doctrine, to read His Word, and to learn that. And that's so that we can operate effectively in heavenly places. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, it tells us of the transformation from being an unbeliever to being a believer. When we were an unbeliever, Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So, when I'm an unbeliever, all I do is sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All I do is sin. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. So, I commit a sin, I earn death. Commit a sin, earn death. That's all I do. But once I'm saved, God says, you're not under the law, you're under grace. God says, I've paid for your sins by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. God says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now I've gone from death, the Bible says I've passed from death unto life. And so it says for us, now that we're saved, the law of the spirit of life. But notice where the life is. It's in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So God gives me the gift of eternal life, but that life is in Christ Jesus. And so I've received God's love, but now God desires that I allow Christ to live in me. 
As Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. So death has died. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So death has died by me being identified with Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And I am given Christ's life because the life which I now, um, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So now Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I should now, once I'm saved, allow Christ to live in me. And when I do that, then that is how I share God's love. So that's why it says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So, just like that couple that gets the house fully paid off, no debt there in Detroit, they shouldn't, whoever gave it to them, that TV show did it, I guess, whoever gave it to them shouldn't have just said, here's the house, okay, bye, do whatever you want. But they should have, the, the people didn't know. You see, if, if I buy a house and I make payments every month for 30 years, and now the house is mine, well, I've got some, I know how to manage my money. Because if, if I didn't know how to manage my money, I never would have made, successfully made 30 years of payments in order to buy my house. So now, I can maintain the house. But, you see, with them, they were just given the house. And they don't know how to manage their money. So then they end up losing the house because they didn't learn those laws. So that's why it's important once we're saved. I mean, we're given the gift of eternal life. But if that, what happened with the people who just got the house, it's just freely given to them. They end up losing the house because they didn't manage their money responsibly in order to pay debts and everything to keep it going because they didn't know how to do it. Well, it's the same way with us. We, are, we operate by the law of sin and death. I, I don't know how to operate in life, in my flesh, because Romans 7.18 says, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So I don't know how to share God's love. I've received God's love, but I don't know how to share it. The way I learn how to share it, the way I learn to operate in it, is the one who operated in it appropriately, the Lord Jesus Christ. He always did what his Father wanted him to do. So that's why Romans 8, 2 says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So the point that Paul is making to the Corinthians is, the issue isn't, well, I want that guy to stop with the father, having sex with the father's wife, his father's wife, or I want you to stop getting drunk in the Lord's Supper and other people don't eat, or I want you to stop eating food offered to idols, or I want you to wear head coverings, or I want you to stop speaking in tongues over each other. You know, these issues that he brings up in the epistles, those are just ends to, uh, means to an end. The end is operating by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Not operating by my fleshly mind anymore, which goes by the law of sin and death, but using the mind of Christ, which is having faith in God and doing whatever God would have us to do. Because when we do that, then we're sharing God's love because 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. If I operate in my flesh, there's no love for others in that because on my flesh dwells no good thing. But if I'm operating in God, living by the faith of the Son of God, and God is love, then I'm going to be sharing God's love. So God didn't give you the gift of eternal life to just be up there in heaven and just rest on the laurels of Christ and not do anything. He wants you to learn sound doctrine so that you live by the faith of the Son of God. So now you're sharing God's love in heavenly places. And the more you know that, the greater the responsibility you receive. So, that's the principle behind the judgment seat of Christ. Now, you notice in 1 Corinthians 2, in verses 9 through 16, Paul talked about that very thing. He says, basically, in verse 16, in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, he says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Well, how do I use the mind of Christ? Well, we're told, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, 
neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So God's got these things prepared. Notice it said in verse 9, God hath prepared for them that love him. It's all about love. That's the currency in God's economy in heavenly places. We live by money, which is equated to the law of sin and death, which is why the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. But if it's love of God, there's no evil in that. And that's according to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So God has prepared all these wonderful things for us who love him, but yet it takes the Spirit of God to reveal them unto us by His Spirit, communicating them to us, to our spirit, as we read God's Word and believe what it says. And that's why he says, you have the mind of Christ. So he ends chapter 2 saying, you have the mind of Christ. Then he starts chapter 3 and verse 1, and he says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. See, that's the problem, is that they've been given the gift of eternal life, they have the mind of Christ, but they haven't used the mind of Christ, and so they're not able to make decisions based upon that sound doctrine. They're not operating in the love of God. They're operating just like they're sinners, just like they were never saved. Like I mentioned that, that couple in Detroit. They get the house freely given to them, and that's a wonderful thing. But you can't just stop there. They need to learn the principles by which they can manage their money so that now they can act responsibly, financially speaking, so that they can make sure they pay their electric bill and their water bill, and they don't make purchases that they can't afford. But since no one taught them that, they end up losing their house. So, similarly, we got the gift of eternal life. But now it doesn't stop there. We need to learn the principles by which Christ's love would come through us to others. And until we learn those principles, we're just going to live as if we're just sinners bound for hell. He says, you are carnal. You've got, he said in chapter 2, you have the mind of Christ. He said in chapter 2, verse 10, that the Spirit is given unto you to teach you the things of God. And yet, here you are, you can't handle any meat. You're not able to bear it because you haven't learned the basic fundamental principles, is what he's saying. And so the judgment seat of Christ here, when he gets down to verse 10 and going forward in chapter 3, is fundamentally talking about, you know, the way God looks at us in terms of what happens at that judgment seat has to do with what we've already done. Since it's a gift, eternal life is a gift given unto us. God cannot take it away. He gave it to us. The issue is now, what do we do with that eternal life? If we continue to operate in sin and death, then all our works are in the flesh and they're not part of that life, they're destroyed. If we operate in Christ Jesus, living by the faith of the Son of God, then what we've done is we've built upon the foundation of the eternal life of Christ. We've used the mind of Christ. And now we're learning how to share God's love in eternity. And so then that means that now we've built up that responsibility so we can handle a greater position in heavenly places. It's just like that couple, they were given that house in Detroit and really, there's nothing that they could do. You couldn't really give them any more responsibility because they couldn't even handle the responsibility of the house that they had. But if they had learned, you know, took a class or learned just basic principles or if someone set a budget for them and showed them how to do these things, you know, how much money do you have coming in, what are your expenses, make sure they match, you know, and all those basic principles of money management, well, then they could handle that responsibly. And so that's what the gift of eternal life is. We've got a place in heavenly places. We spend all eternity in heaven. And since it's a gift, God's not going to take it away from us. It's not like the house that was repossessed by that, that couple there. Um, God gave it as a gift, so it's not going to be taken away. 
Uh, there's no debt that we owe there. Jesus Christ paid for that uh, on Calvary. But now the issue is, is that all we're going to do? Uh, or are we going to allow Christ to live in, in us so that now we have uh, operating in God's love so now we can have greater responsibility in heavenly places so that we can share God's love to a greater extent while we're there? That's the issue of the judgment seat of Christ. When you get to the judgment seat, and we'll go through the verses in a second here, you cannot lose your salvation. We'll see that in verse 15. And the reason is, if you go over to the book of Hebrews, and chapter 9, Hebrews in chapter 9, um, and also before we read that, uh, let's look at um, Colossians chapter 2. So we know that before we are saved, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And since the wages of sin is death, then that means that we are bound to spend eternity in a lake of fire. That's where we're headed toward uh, before we are saved. Now, uh, once we recognize our sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin, then what we see in Colossians 2 happens. It says in verse 10, Colossians 2.10, And ye are complete in Him, that's in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. Remember that, head of all principality and power. That's going to be important when we talk about the judgment seat. So we are complete in Him, and He is the head of all principality and power. Verse 11 says, Being complete means that ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So what that means is that before, when you sinned in your flesh, then that sin linked to your soul, resulting in death. That's why Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. I sin in my flesh, then my soul is corrupted by that sin, and so then I'm dead. Because who you really are is your soul. But it says here that when you were saved, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So that means when you're saved, then the, the sin, that means the flesh is cut off from the soul in that if you sin in your flesh, that sin does not go back to the soul and then your soul is corrupted. That can't happen because Christ has cut off the link going from things you do in your flesh going toward your soul. He's cut that off. He's established a link between your soul and your spirit. Your spirit is alive in Christ Jesus, therefore your soul is alive in Christ Jesus. Your flesh still is vile. There's no good thing in it. But because the link between your flesh and your soul has been cut, even if you do sin in your flesh, your soul doesn't bear that sin. So he says there in verse 11, that you're spiritually circumcised, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. Verse 12 says you're buried with him in baptism, meaning you're identified with Christ's death. So since you're identified with Christ's death, you are also identified with his resurrection. So it says, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So it's the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's faithfulness to raise you from the dead because you've believed the gospel. So you are risen together with Christ. Verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So the death of the Lord Jesus Christ forgives all your trespasses in the past. And then you're circumcised, spiritually speaking, so that any sins you do in the future are also forgiven because they are cut off from affecting your soul by the spiritual circumcision of Christ. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Again, we see principalities and powers mentioned. That'll be important later. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So the principalities and powers there is the third of Satan's kingdom. Satan and a third of the angels 
rebelled against God, and so they are principalities and powers that are rebellion. They are against God. They're, and so uh, what Christ did in forgiving you of your sins is he spoiled the power that Satan and his forces have over you, triumphing over the devil and his forces in the cross. So now Satan has no death power over you because death is swallowed up in victory through the cross work of Christ. And that's what Hebrews 9 tells you. Hebrews 9, when it talks about Christ's death, in verse 24, in Hebrews 9, 24, it says, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So what he did was, God says, I've sinned. I can't be in God's presence due to my sin and due to God's holiness. Therefore, Christ died for my sins. He was made sin for me. He offered his blood in heavenly places, appeared in the presence of God for us as that propitiation or the fully satisfying sacrifice for our sins. And so then God, when we believe the gospel, God sees the blood of Christ as being an atonement for our sins and says our sins are fully paid for by the blood of Christ which means we have died, as we've seen before. We, were, uh, we are dead to sin and alive unto Christ. So then it says uh, in verse 25, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered, entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Keep that in mind. He had to suffer for your sins. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Put away sin. And it continues there in verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So what it's saying there is that it's appointed unto men once to die, after that the judgment. So for you, when you recognized your sin and trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, you were buried with him in baptism. You were crucified with Christ. So you were dead. You died. And so after death comes the judgment, and then you are judged to get eternal life because your sin has been fully paid for. If I owe a, a million dollars and someone takes me to court, it says... Judge, give me a million dollars. This guy owes me, Eric owes me a million dollars, he hasn't paid. Well then, if someone steps up and gives that plaintiff a million dollars in my place, then the judge will have to say, you can't collect anything from Eric because this person has stepped up and paid Eric's debt for him. So Eric doesn't owe a debt. And that's how it is with our sin. The wages of sin is death. So we've earned death with our sin. Jesus Christ died for our sin. So since he died for our sin, the judge, which is also the Lord Jesus Christ, the judge, God himself, the Lord, says Eric's sin death has been fully paid for. So death is swallowed up in victory, 1 Corinthians 15 says, because Jesus Christ paid my sin debt by dying for my sins. So since uh, now, that means I'm judged, and I'm judged to get eternal life. So going back to Colossians, if you look in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, he says in verse 1, remember we read Colossians 2, now going on to Colossians 3, verse 1 he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, so if you've believed the gospel, then you are dead with Christ and you're risen together with him for, for new life. So that means you should live by the faith of the Son of God, getting sound doctrine in your inner man, building up Christ's love in you so that you know how to share God's love in heaven for all eternity. So he says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So again, it's just like that couple in Detroit. I've given you the house free and clear. Well, if you've got the house free and clear, now you've got to figure out 
how to keep the house and how to manage the house appropriately. So you need to learn money management principles. In the spirit realm, I am risen with Christ. My debt is fully paid. I don't owe anything anymore. And God gives me eternal life. The eternal life I'm given is in heavenly places. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So since I'm given heavenly places, <coughs> since I'm risen with Christ, now I need to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God because I am in Christ. That's where he is seated. So I am in heavenly places with him. So now I need to set my affection on things above, not on things of the earth. The Detroit couple that gets the house for free, they need to figure out how to manage the household so that it will act appropriately so they don't, you know, so everything runs smoothly in that house. When I get eternal life, now I need to learn how the household in heaven works. How does God's love be shared there? That's the currency of heaven is God's love. How do I receive and give out God's love since now I am seated together with Christ in that position of authority where my sin debt has been fully paid? And notice it says there in verse 3, For ye are dead. Ye are dead. And we saw in Hebrews 9, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. So just like if I owe a million dollars, and somebody comes along and gives the person I owe it to, they give them a million dollars on my behalf, that debt is cleared, so then the court says, the debt is cleared, there's no need to talk about it. The judgment has been set. Is I owe the debt, it's been paid, case dismissed. That's how it is for your sin debt. You have earned death due to your sin. Jesus Christ came along and paid for that sin debt. So once you believe the gospel, God sees as judge, he sees the blood of Christ as fully paid for your sins. So now God judges that you have eternal life. So that's why as it's pointed out, a man wants to die after that, the judgment. So Christ uh, bore the sins of many. So same thing here for us is once we believe the gospel, we are given the gift. That's why we are given the gift of eternal life because our sins are fully paid for. But now, again, remember where the Corinthians are. They are carnal. And Paul has fed them with milk and they still don't get the milk. They need to get the meat now. They need to share. Their sins have been forgiven. They need to build upon that foundation and learn the principles by which heaven operates is God's love. They need to operate by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus rather than operating by the law of sin and death. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10, he says, according to the, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation he laid was Jesus Christ. He did back in chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2, it says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the foundation was, Paul says, I look at you Corinthians, you look just like the heathen out there who don't believe. So I've got to see if you've got the foundation. Have you recognized Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin? That's what I need to know. That's all I need to know. Once I know that, once I've recognized, you've recognized your sin, you've trusted in the gospel in order to be saved, now I know you've got the foundation of Jesus Christ. The foundation of Jesus Christ is He has paid for your sin, He's conquered death for you, He's given you the gift of eternal life. But again, God didn't save you just for that. That's the foundation. God now wants to build upon it His love. And love is something that you have to choose to accept. And the way you choose it is by reading God's Word, as He talked about in 1 Corinthians 2. You read God's Word. The Holy Ghost teaches it to you. You, learn the mind, you use the mind of Christ making those decisions. And the love of God is built up as a gradual process in your heart. And so that love is built upon the foundation of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So when he says there in 1 Corinthians 3.10, he says, 
Paul says he is a wise master builder and that he laid the foundation. So he's wise in that he looked through the smoke screen of churchianity. He didn't say, well, did you take the Eucharist? Did you walk an aisle? Were you water baptized? See, he didn't go to them with religion. That's what religion says. He's a wise master builder. He says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what I wanted to learn. I'm wise in that I know what gives you the foundation, what gives you eternal life, and that's the blood of Christ. So I built that foundation on you. I shared a clear gospel with you, and you believed it. But now, you go over to 1 Corinthians 4.15, and 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul says that you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul looks at the Corinthian church, he says, I know you're saved, you believe the gospel, but I see that people have built carnal foundations upon that, just like churchianity does. You may have people that go to a church who are going to heaven because they believe the clear gospel. But they are carnal just like the rest of the world. The divorce rate among churchianity is higher than it is among people outside of churchianity. That shows they're carnal. That's one factor. I mean, there are many other statistics you could look at, but that's one factor to show because God says the two become one when they're, when they're married. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. But yet, due to things happen, and I know I'm not blaming anybody if you're in that situation. I know things can happen, but it's all carnality is the reason. Whether it's on your behalf, someone else's behalf, both parties, doesn't matter. There is carnality that ends up separating the two. That shows the church is carnal if the divorce rate is higher there than it is outside of the church. It's just one of the factors there. It shows that the, what's been built upon the foundation, even though they may be going to heaven, what's been built upon the foundation is like these 10,000 instructors in Christ. It's a fleshly type thing. So he says, I have, in verse 10 of chapter 3, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. you got to take heed to make sure you're using the mind of Christ. You're using sound doctrine. You're not using carnality. You're not using religion. Verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that's what we've covered in the last 30 minutes or so. We've talked about the foundation of you've recognized your sin, you've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin. Christ then... Uh, you died with Christ, you're circumcised with Him, uh, you're given the gift of eternal life, and now you have, you're complete in Christ, and now you're raising, risen together with Him in new life. Uh, that's the foundation. Now it's your responsibility to build upon that foundation some elements, some spiritual elements that will last for all eternity. So he says in verse 12, Now if any man build upon this foundation... Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So what he says, the day shall declare it, that's referring to the day of the judgment seat of Christ, in which he judges you uh, based upon your works. Now again, the foundation, we've already got eternal life, so we're not talking about that. We're talking about what man has built upon the foundation. And the gold, silver, precious stones is the good stuff. The wood, hay, and stubble is the bad stuff. The reason we know that is because verse 13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What sort it is. So, if I put gold, silver, precious stones in a fire, the only, when it comes out of the fire, the gold, silver, precious stones is going to be left. And whatever dross or any impurities that are in were going to be burned out of that. Uh, but if, it's, if I put wood, hay, or stubble in the fire, the fire is just going to completely... Uh, get rid of that. There's not going to be, you'll have some ashes. You know, if I put a piece of wood in that fire, uh, and the fire is hot enough or burns long enough, uh, when it's taken out, there is no piece of wood. The wood is completely disintegrated. It's ashes. 
Uh, same thing with hay or stubble. Uh, the hay and stubble isn't there. The hay that a horse eats, if it gets burned up in the fire, they don't have any food because the hay is completely burned up. Gold, silver, or precious stones, on the other hand, they survive the fire. So, what we know then is that if your work is gold, silver, or precious stones, then that must be the good stuff. That's what you did in Christ. As remember, verse 11, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And you've got to take heed how you build thereon. If you build Jesus Christ on that, that must equate to gold, silver, and precious stones because the fire will try it and it will survive the fire. And the way we build gold, silver, precious stones is the process that he already identified in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. That God has prepared things for them that love him and God reveals them unto us by his spirit. And then we use the mind of Christ to set our affection on things above. So in other words, we look at the spiritual implications of our decisions rather than the physical. And so then, if we're doing it by the, by the spiritual, which is using the mind of Christ, then that means we're, the love of Christ is coming through us to others. Uh, they may not receive it, but you still have the love of Christ coming through you. If I am making decisions based on my fleshly mind, not based upon what the Holy Spirit teaches me through Christ in His Word, then I'm not using the mind of Christ. I'm using physical considerations, and the physical will pass away. Jesus says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So if it's built upon God's word, it's not going to pass away. It's gold, silver, precious stones. If it's built upon the things of this world, the material stuff, heaven and earth shall pass away. So what the judgment seat of Christ is all about is that we stand there. Again, we've got the foundation of Jesus Christ. Because you see there that Paul was very careful to say that the Corinthians, he first saw in 1 Corinthians 2, he determined that Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he's talking to save people. And now he's talking about what did you build upon the foundation? If the foundation is Jesus Christ, then you're saved, you're there. That's why he says in verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if Jesus Christ is laid as their foundation, they are saved. And you can't have any other foundation than that because it's no foundation. If your foundation is wood, hay, and stubble, and wood, hay, and stubble is completely disintegrated in a fire, then the foundation ceases to exist. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, heaven and earth shall pass away. So if I build a foundation that is built upon heaven and earth, then it's going to be destroyed. It's no foundation. But if I've laid the foundation of Jesus Christ, the gospel, he's conquered death for me, then now we've got a building that lasts. So he says, what's laid for you, Corinthians, is the foundation of Jesus Christ. You're already saved. So that's why we know everybody who appears at the judgment seat is saved because they've all got the foundation of Jesus Christ. If they don't have the foundation of Jesus Christ, then they're not raised to life. The only time they're raised is at the judgment seat, uh, at the, not the judgment seat, the great white throne judgment. Go over to Revelation 20, and you can see that. You can see the difference there. In Revelation chapter 20, and verse 11, this is the judgment for unbelievers, great white throne judgment. Revelation 20 verse 11 says, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. The dead are there. Remember us, when we believe the gospel, we have, God gave us life. We are given the gift of eternal life. We have life in Christ. So if the dead are raised, that's not believers. These are unbelievers. Unbelievers are dead in their trespasses and sins. Believers are alive in Christ. So it says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. 
and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. What you're going to find out is that all of them end up going to hell. Because it's quite simple. If, God if you are dead and God judges you by the book of life, then you didn't meet the life standard because you're dead. There's no life in you because of your sin. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. Therefore, all people here that are judged go to hell. It says in verse 12, the sea gave up the dead, remember the dead again, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead. Again, death, hell, dead, which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Paul tells us that when we are saved, we pass from death unto life. So everybody at the great white throne judgment is unbelievers, and they all go to hell and experience the second death because they are dead in their sins. But everybody at the judgment seat of Christ, we're told, 1 Corinthians 3.11 other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if the Jesus Christ foundation has already been laid with the Corinthians, that means they've already passed from death to life. So everybody at the judgment seat of Christ already has life in Christ Jesus because they have the foundation of Jesus Christ. So that means everybody at this judgment already has eternal life, and the judgment isn't about that. That's why Hebrews 9 said, as appointed unto men wants to die, and after that the judgment. And remember what we saw in Colossians 2. When I believed the gospel, I was complete in Christ. Why? Because he has circumcised me with the circumcision made without hands, and cutting off the body of the sins of the flesh. He's buried me with him in baptism. I'm risen with him in new life. He's forgiven me of all my trespasses. So what all that tells me is the moment I believe the gospel, I pass from death to life. Which means death has died, which means death has been judged. It's pointed out a man wants to die after that, the judgment. If I've already received, received eternal life now, then I am already was dead, which means I've already been judged to receive eternal life. So my judgment, as far as God is concerned, when it comes to my life, where I'm going to be, if I, if I, the moment that I believe the gospel, God judges me to be alive in Christ. And I don't have to appear before God to account for my works like the, the great white throne judgment. Why? Because of what we read in Hebrews 9. Christ, I'll read it to you again so that I don't misquote it, because I don't have that one memorized. Hebrews 9 tells you, verse 24 for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The reason we receive eternal life the moment we believe the gospel is that Christ has already appeared in the presence of God on behalf of all believers. And the moment you believe that gospel, God says, I see the blood. God sees the blood of Christ. And he sees it's sufficient to atone for everybody's sin, for everybody who has ever lived. But the moment you believe the gospel, God says, I now see that you have accepted the blood atonement of Jesus Christ for your sins. And since the blood has, Christ has appeared in the very presence of God with his blood for us already, God says the moment that you believe the gospel, God recognizes that blood of Christ as atonement for your sin, you are judged, you are, death has died, and you are given eternal life by the blood of Christ. That happens the moment you believe the gospel. And the reason you don't have to physically appear before God in order to pay for your sins or account for your sins, as we see at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, is because Hebrews 9.24 says that Christ is, 
is in heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Christ appeared for us. That's why we're not at the great white throne judgment. Christ has already made that appearance for us. The moment we believe, God says, I recognize that that appearance of Christ with his blood now is payment for Eric's sins. And it's for everybody else here, everybody who believes the gospel. He says, now I recognize that as payment. Christ has already appeared for us. I recognize that payment. Death has died, and you are judged to have eternal life. And that's the foundation that everybody has at the judgment seat of Christ. Because we appear in Christ. So going back to 1 Corinthians 3 then, so now we're not, the issue isn't the foundation. Because verse 11 says that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ took care of that foundational judgment when he appeared in heaven with his blood in the presence of God for us. So now we're dealing with the building upon the foundation. And we're seeing that the building is either in verse 12, it's a good building, gold, silver, precious stones, or it's a bad building, wood, hay, or stubble. And the fire determines what sort it is. Verse 14 says, if any man's work, remember the foundation, we're not talking about that. We're talking, remember verse 10? I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. What I build upon the foundation, the foundation is Jesus Christ, verse 11. What I build upon the foundation is the work. So what's judged at the judgment seat of Christ is the work on the foundation. And so, every verse 13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So once I'm saved, it's my responsibility to read God's word, believe it, and then use the mind of Christ to apply that sound doctrine. If I do that, and that's what he went over in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. If I do that, then I've built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ gold, silver, precious stones. And gold, silver, precious stones survive the fire. But if I built wood, hay, and stubble, that means I followed the flesh, carnality. That is going to be burned. Fire burns up wood, hay, and stubble. It turns into ashes. It dis the wood, hay, and stubble disappears. Gold, silver, precious stones... It doesn't. Uh, the gold, silver, precious stones survive. Hold your place. Go to Malachi chapter 3. Um, in Malachi chapter 3, you have Jesus Christ talking about this. Now, this is for Israel, but again, it's the same principle in terms of going through the fire. Uh, we have Israel's program, and we have the body of Christ program. And we don't mix the programs, but we understand that everybody is a man, Everybody has sinned. Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. Christ died for all of us, whether you're Jew or Gentile, regardless of what dispensation you're in. And the only way you get eternal life, whether it's on earth for Israel or it's in heaven for the body of Christ, is through the blood of Christ atoning for your sins. So the judgment, and then, of course, if you're, regardless of what program you're in, then it's up to you to read and believe God's word and allow Christ to live in you. So the process is all the same, even though the reward is different. We're in heavenly places, Israel is on earth. Either way, it's still the same process. So in Malachi chapter 3, at verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now the messenger is referring to John the Baptist preparing the way. And then when he comes into the uh, temple here, it's a reference to Jesus' second coming. Now Jesus did come the first time, but he didn't come in judgment. He came to pay for Israel's sins. So that when he comes suddenly comes into his temple here, it's referring to the judgment. And verse 2 says, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. So what Jesus does with Israel is the same thing he does with us. 
We are sinners, regardless of what dispensation we're in. I'm mm. fine. We are sinners, regardless of what dispensation we're in. Jesus Christ's blood atones for our sins when we believe the gospel, regardless of what dispensation we're in. The Word of God is built up in the inner man so that Christ can live in us, regardless of what dispensation we're in. So it's the same process. And so it says then, when he comes for Jesus' second coming there for Israel, who's going to abide the day of his coming? Because he is like a refiner's fire. So the judgment here is very similar to the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3. That's why they're easily confused. Verse 3 says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Remember gold, silver, precious stones? Well, here's your silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. Sons of Levi, there will be a reference to the believing remnant of Israel. Because Exodus 19 says that Israel is to be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles in the millennial reign. And the tribe of Levi was one of the 12 tribes. That was the priestly tribe. So when it says the sons of Levi, it's referring in a spiritual context to the believing remnant of Israel who is going to go to the Gentiles in the millennial reign. So he's going to purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So what that's telling you then is for Israel's program, God judges the believing remnant of Israel. He puts them through the refiner's fire, meaning he purifies out the dross. Because even though we're believers and we have the gift of eternal life, even after we're saved, all of us sin and operate in our flesh to some extent. So all of us is going to have some impurities in us, even at that time. But we don't account for them. We don't pay the cost for them because remember, God's already judged us, given us the gift of eternal life. So when we go through the fire, any impurities then is going to be purged away. And that's what he's talking about with Israel here. So you have the believing remnant of Israel. Now, they don't receive the atonement until Jesus' second coming. So for us, in the dispensation of grace, we receive the atonement the moment we believe. So, when we go through the fire, the things that are burned or survive are our works, whether they're in Christ or not. It has nothing to do with our eternal salvation. But for Israel, because they don't receive the atonement until Jesus' second coming, then they receive the forgiveness of sins at that time, which means they have some impurities that need to be purged out. So, he purges out the impurities on the believers and so now they are gold and silver and they are offering in righteousness that is pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So that's what happens with Israel. So you can see the reason for the, the judgment here is to purify out sin. That's for Israel. Now for us in the dispensation of grace at the judgment seat of Christ, since we're already told in 1 Corinthians 3 that we've already got the foundation of Jesus Christ, and we learn from Colossians 2, that means we're forgiven all our trespasses and we've already received the spiritual circumcision so that those trespasses can't hurt us anymore. Then what is at issue with us isn't our salvation. We've already got that judge. What's issued with us, what's the issue here, is our work. It's talking about the sanctification process. So if I built upon it sound doctrine, that survives and I receive a reward based upon that doctrine. But if I built wood, hay, and stubble, that's bad doctrine, churchianity, or works of the flesh, carnality, whatever it is, that's going to be burned out at the fire, and then I'm going to suffer the loss of that reward. So I don't receive a reward because there's nothing to be rewarded. Again, if the couple in Detroit gets a house free and clear, if they don't learn how to manage their money, then that household, there's no reward in the house. You know, they don't end up getting a, a couch or a sofa or a bed or, or a, you know, cable TV or, you know, whatever material things that you would fill a house with. They don't have it 
uh, because they didn't operate in good money management principles. So for me, after I believe the gospel, I've got eternal life. I've got it as a gift. What do I build upon it? If I build upon it fleshly, carnal things, those pass away. But if I build spiritual things, well, now i got some things that will dwell in the household of God in heavenly places. So then that's going to survive the fire. So it says there in verse 14, 1 Corinthians 3, 14, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So you're going to receive a reward of a position in heavenly places. Verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Yet so as by fire. So I built the work upon that, but it was just carnality. That's what the Corinthians have right here. He says, I fed you with milk and you couldn't even handle the milk. So if the Corinthians were to die at this point, they would appear at the judgment seat of Christ, saved individuals because they had the foundation of Jesus Christ, but they have no gold, silver, precious stones. So then they're going to receive a loss of reward, but they are saved, yet so as by fire. To give you an idea what that means, yet so as by fire, let's go over to Daniel chapter 3. It's a good illustration. Daniel 3 is a type of what this is talking about here. And Daniel chapter 3, you have the three Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their Babylonian names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Nebuchadnezzar has said, bow down to the image or you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. And Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah says, God says, we're not to bow down. We're not to have any other gods before us. So we refuse to bow down to your image. And so he throws them into this fiery furnace. Uh, you see in uh, Daniel chapter 3, Verse 21, Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Okay, so these are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're cast in, and they got all their clothes on. Okay, they're cast into the furnace. Uh, verse 22, Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So they're bound, they've got clothes on, they've got hair, they've got everything there. They're in the furnace. Verse 24, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So three men bound, cast into the fire. They come out, there's four men, and they're loose, and the fourth man is like the Son of God. And so then Nebuchadnezzar has him taken out, verse 27, the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. So, the three men are bound, they have clothes and hair, they go into the fire, they're loosed, by the fourth man, the Son of God, they come out the other side, and not only are they alive, but they've still got their clothes. They've still got every hair. That's why Jesus said, even the hairs of your hair are numbered. Why? Because they're going to go through the fire. And if they've got, spiritually speaking, gold, silver, precious stones going into the fire, coming out, they're going to have everything. In this case, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego because they trusted in God, went into the fire, spiritually speaking, as pure gold, silver, precious stone. No dross. No impurities in them. Because they were fully trusting in God. So then they come out of the fire, and they still have everything left. 
That's what it's talking about in 1 Corinthians 3 when it says if, in verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, we don't have time to go into it, but I've done a couple messages in the past and talked about how when Jesus Christ died, he went into the torments of hell and he suffered down in hell to pay for our sins. Jesus, it says in Psalm 6, I'll just read you one verse. It says in Psalm 16, in Psalm 16 and verse 10, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So Jesus Christ went to hell, his soul went to hell, and was burning in that fire. It was in that fire. But because he is pure, pure gold, silver, precious stones, he has no sin in him. 1 Peter 2.22 says Christ did no sin. Because there was no sin in him, then he came out without corruption. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and they look like they never had even been in there. They don't even smell like they had any fire. No damage done to them whatsoever. Christ died for our sins by going into hell fire. But, he says, Thou will not leave my soul in hell. The justice of God says, once the sin debt was fully paid in hell, God raised Jesus from the dead, and he had no corruption in him. So, no suffering from the fire. Now remember what we read in Colossians 3. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Remember, Jesus Christ died for our sins. He's the fully satisfying sacrifice. Remember that we are buried with him in baptism, and we are risen together with him in new life. So if we are buried with him in baptism, that God says that that means we're identified with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So if we're identified with his death, it means we're identified with that fire. And just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fire, Jesus was there with him, and Jesus kept them safe so that when they come out, they have no harm. That's what it means in 1 Corinthians 3 when it talks about he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We go into the fires of hell with Jesus Christ, but because our lives are hid with Christ in God, we never feel it, and there's no ill effects from that. So, when we are saved, yet so as by fire, it means the fires of hell have tried the body of Christ, and Christ fully paid for our sins. So, he suffered no corruption, and because our lives are hid with Christ in God, we suffer no corruption. So, we come out of the fire with everything that is of Christ on us, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had clothes. They were bound by their sins. Christ loosed them from their sins, and because their clothes were, they were fully relying on God there, they fully trusted in God, then it means that this clothes survived the fire. So too, the judgment seat of Christ refers to, first off, the foundation's already been laid, Jesus Christ. So we've already been saved with that fire. That's already happened, because we've already received the atonement. We're already justified by His blood. That's already happened. So the issue here really is the works. Are they gold, silver, precious stones, are, or are they wood, hay, or stubble? And so the, the, um, the judgment is going to try them. So I'm going to be saved. It says in verse 15, even if I am just carnal, I never get sound doctrine in the inner man, I never build up the mind of Christ, then I am still saved, then I suffer loss. I don't receive a position in heavenly places, but I receive... Uh, but I still have eternal life because I am saved because Jesus Christ went through the fires of hell for me. So I'm saved by that fire because I was in Christ. But any uh, fleshly works or carnality that I had in me wasn't in Christ. So that's on the outward it's, and it's purged out. And so then I suffer loss if that's all I have built up. And then verse 16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So again, that talks about Jesus Christ going through the fire for me, that my life is hid 
with Christ in God. Uh, and so it says, don't you know that you are still going to be saved regardless because you are the temple of God. Christ has already paid that sin debt for you. But at the same time, if you build the temple of God's spiritual things, then it's something that grows as a habitation for God. If not, then that's something that is destroyed. So that then it says then, verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Well, the any man, it can't be referring to the Corinthians losing their salvation. Because we already found out in verse 15 that if the man's work is burned up, he is still saved, yet so as by fire. But verse 17, this man, it says God's going to destroy. God's not saving this man. This man is destroyed. So this man that he's talking about goes back to verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Why do you need to take heed? Well, if I'm just a money grubber, all I care about is getting your money. I haven't believed the gospel. I just say, hey, these are some gullible people here and I'm going to give them some doctrine uh, that will convince them to give me their money. Um, so I come in, and basically what I'm doing then is I'm building carnality upon that foundation. So that person then is not a saved person. And what they've done is, as verse 17 says, they've defiled the temple of God. Because remember, the believers in Corinth are the temple of God. And chapter 4, verse 15 says, they have 10,000 instructors in Christ. So they've got a whole bunch of people trying to come in and tell them what to do because the, the Corinthian uh, culture is pagan and they've got some money. So they figure they can take advantage of them and teach some false doctrine to get some money out of them. So in doing so then, that is a man who defiles the temple of God. So that person, God is going to destroy. So if someone who's not a believer, comes in and teaches false doctrine to the believers. Then they've defiled the temple of God, and that person God is going to destroy. When we get to chapter 5, it looks like the man who is having sex with his father's wife, it looks like he is an unbeliever, based upon 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11 and verse 13. We'll get to that you know, in a couple weeks, but just to let you know that. Well, maybe that's a man who has taught false doctrine that you can do kind of this kind of sexual sin and be okay. That's a man who is not saved and he's defiled the temple of God by trying to get them involved in carnality rather than the things of God. And so it says, him shall God destroy. Why? Because the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now if that man came in and he was a saved individual, but all he taught was carnality, he would still have eternal life, God would not destroy him because he would be at the judgment seat and his work, which is carnality, would be burned, but he himself would be saved, yet so as by fire, because he would be part of the temple of God. But if he's not a believer and he defiles the temple of God, then he's not the temple of God, he's judged according to his works and God destroys him. So we know from verse 17 when it says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. By definition, that must be referring to an unsaved person. Because if he's a saved person, then he is going to be in the category of verse 15, where his work will be burned for defiling the temple of God, and he'll receive loss of reward, but he himself will be saved because his life is hid with Christ in God. But if he's just somebody who is one of those 10,000 instructors who's just trying to get their money, who hasn't believed the gospel, that he's defiled the temple of God, he's not a believer, so he's not in Christ, and so God will destroy him. So don't read verse 17 and say, oh, you can lose your salvation, because he's already confirmed in verse 15 that you cannot, because he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire, even though you suffer loss. Now, um, what I'm going to do for the rest of the message here is I'm going to uh, give a response to uh, what Rodney covered last Sunday in the judgment seat of Christ, and that should answer some issues because if you listen to Rodney or you, um, you know, you believe like he did in that, 
uh, what I there will be some probably some objections to what I just told you in the last hour uh, what these verses say. So what we're going to do in responding is hopefully I uh, respond to all those issues that would be brought up. And uh, then that, I'm thinking, that should give us a clear picture on the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, if it doesn't, if there are still some issues that you have, uh, feel free to ask me questions. I'll be glad to answer them. We'll do that in the Q&A. Okay, so um, first off, let me say about Rodney is that um, my understanding is that he is very similar in beliefs and teaching as to what I do, just because a lot of people who listen to me also listen to him. Uh, until I listen to the message that he did on Sunday, I have never listened to any message he's ever given. So this isn't a blanket statement about him. All I'm doing is I'm looking at this specific message, and I found some doctrine that I believe is contrary to God's word rightly divided, and I'm going to share that with you uh, just to try to eliminate some confusion and to get us aligned with go what God's Word says. And again, if there are anything afterward, I'll be glad to answer. Um, the message he gave last time was an hour and 40 minutes long. Um, I can't complain about that because that's how long my messages go, uh, usually. The, if you haven't listened to it, um, that's okay. Uh, you don't have to, uh, but if you wanted to, I would suggest just listening to the last 30 minutes because that's really the first, to me, the first, uh, what was that, hour and, that's 170 minutes, the first 70 minutes, first hour and 10 minutes, um, he didn't really cover the judgment seat of Christ, so he was doing background stuff. Um, so if you want to listen to it, I'd recommend listening to the last 30 minutes. Uh, if you have listened to it all, one of the first things he says, and I'm just going to go in the order of the message, one of the first things he said was, we are the body of Christ by default. And I don't know exactly what he means by that, but I took it to mean what he was saying is that God's plan was Israel all along to save Israel. And it's only because Israel was an unbelief that God created the body of Christ. That's what I got out of it. Again, I could be wrong, but that's what I got out of it. And... Um, if I got that out of it, maybe you did too. So I would say to that, uh, I took objection to that. Uh, if you go over to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So we are blessed in heavenly places. Israel's kingdom is on the earth. And verse 4 says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So according to these verses, we're not just an afterthought to God. Again, that's not what, I don't know, maybe Rodney didn't mean that. That's just what I took it to mean. Uh, it says that before the foundation of the world, God has chosen us to be in him in heavenly places. Uh, so... Uh, we're, what I'm just bringing up to say the body of Christ is just as much a part of God's plan from the beginning as Israel is. Now, God didn't reveal the body of Christ until after uh, he, till he gave it to Paul in Acts chapter 9. But at least God's plan all along was to save the body of Christ and put us in heavenly places. We're not an afterthought or we're not plan B. We're all, we were part of God's plan from the beginning all along. Uh, another thing he said in the first 25 minutes of his message is he said that for many years uh, he's had a check in his spirit uh, regarding the right division teaching on the judgment seat of Christ and that he's not agreed with it for many years and that this message that he did last Sunday was many years in the making. Um, I just wanted to note that, and this goes along with what we were talking about last Tuesday, uh, we got to be very careful when we use the terminology check in spirit because now we're relying upon feelings. And when we, when we pray to God, we need to really be relying upon the objective truth of God's Word. Um, I personally have been in right division 25 years, and I have had no check in my spirit for the last 25 years over the teaching of us being in heavenly places and having positions of thrones, principalities, powers, dominions. Uh, I have no problem with that, no check in my spirit over that time. Um, all I'm just saying is, when we form sound doctrine, we want to make sure it's based upon the objective Word of God. 
when we go by our feelings, well, maybe that is the Spirit of God. We do have the Spirit of God within us. It could be the Spirit of God providing that check. But then again, maybe it's not. Maybe it's my own feelings. I have a fleshly mind, but I also have the mind of Christ. Which one did I use to determine that the heavenly places was correct? Which one did Rodney use? You know, I can't tell you what's in his heart, what he was going by. Um, but I tell you personally, uh, if I do feel a check in the Spirit, the way I get rid of that is I go to the objective Word of God and make sure I'm following what God's Word says rightly divided as my answer and not let my emotions follow me. Again, I'm not saying that's what he did. I'm just saying when you use that term check in Spirit, to me that's a, a red flag. You know, uh, you know, are you really making the Bible your authority? Uh, the uh, let's see the third thing that he mentioned, and this was still in the first. Uh, this was actually after about half an hour in or so. Uh, he mentions um, Acts nine. This was actually fifty-eight minutes in. I wrote it down. Fifty-eight minutes in. He says Acts nine to twenty-eight is a transition from law to grace, and I wanted to mention that's not true. That uh, in Romans six fourteen, which was written in that transition period. God says, you are not under the law, but under grace. There is an abrupt, my point is there is an abrupt change from uh, law to grace. Once you get to the dispensation of grace in Acts chapter 9, uh, it's fully in motion. You are part, the person who believes the gospel and is saved in Acts chapter 10, for example, Cornelius, is just as much under grace as someone who is saved in, after Acts 28 somebody like me or you. There is no transition in that term. Now, there is a, a diminishing away of Israel during that time, uh, but you are fully under grace and fully a member of the body of Christ once you are saved. Uh, then going uh, 76 minutes into his message, he mentions that the uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, is the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and really, uh, what you have there is, for sake of time, I won't go into that, but really, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, specifically deals with the people who went through the tribulation period. And it says at the end of verse 4 that they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And verse 6 says, they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. So that's specifically, that language tells us that's specifically related to Israel's program that they're ruling and reigning on the earth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 has to do with heavenly places and the body of Christ. And we know that because it's a personal thing where he's talking about the judgment that the Corinthians are going to go through. For, for sake of time, I won't go into that, uh, unless you have a question afterward. So I wanted to mention that. Now the next thing I wanted to mention, and he spent some time on this, is he talks about the different levels of authority and he goes over to Luke 19. Uh, if you go over to Luke 19, and Luke 19, now this is the judgment of believing Israel, the believing remnant here. Um, there are these uh, servants here. It says in verse 12, Luke 19, 12, he said, therefore, a certain... Actually, verse 11, for the context, it says, Luke 19, 11, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So it's a reference to the kingdom of God, and basically, Jesus is going to give them a parable to show that, G, that the kingdom of God isn't going to appear right now. There are a lot of things that have to happen before that takes place. Verse 12, he said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So that ends up being Jesus Christ. Um, he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom. So that's a reference there to his second coming. Jesus Christ comes back. He's received the kingdom from his father. And now he's going to set it up on earth. Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him. 
to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Uh, then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. So, uh, we're going to get to it very soon. Ephesians 1 talks about in heavenly places, we've got thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, mights. That's the structure of authority, of rulership in heavenly places. Well, what Rodney is saying is that, well, in the earthly kingdom, that's what you have. And it says that here for Israel, here's a servant, and because he was faithful, then he gets authority over ten cities. So maybe that's a principality, let's say, for sake of argument. So he gets a principality. And what Rodney was saying is that the principalities, powers, mights, dominions relate only to Israel's program that we don't have that in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, we just go to heaven. And so the principalities and powers and mights have to do with the judgment given to Israel, which means the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3 is only Israel's judgment. And so he's saying, here's what the judgment is like. And Luke 19 is a judgment for Israel. And there are principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and thrones in the earthly kingdom for Israel. That is true. So this is exactly what's going on for Israel. And so he says, you get authority over ten cities, so let's say that is a principality. So that's true then. In Israel's program, they get a position of authority in the earthly kingdom. And then verse 18, the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. Uh, and he saith unto him, first off, that statement by that guy shows he's an unbeliever. Because Jesus didn't reap what, is not trying to reap what he did not sow. Jesus sowed eternal life by dying on a cross for our sins. And when he gives us the gift of eternal life, he is reaping what he sowed. He reaps eternal life because that's what he sowed for us. Uh, anyway, so that's a false statement this, this guy makes. Notice verse 22. He saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee. Notice what he says. Thou wicked servant. Thou wicked servant. What that means is this person is not going to have eternal life. Now, it doesn't specifically tell you that in the Luke 19 passage, but the parallel passage is Matthew 25, and it does tell you that. So let's go over there in Matthew 25. Matthew 25. It's the same thing, except instead of referring to it was called a pound. Uh, you got a pound in Luke 19, and then you gain pounds on top of it. And uh, Matthew 25, it's called talents. And that's referred to as money. So it's just another word for the same thing, really. And uh, this, it's, the details are a little different, and for the sake of time, we won't go into all that. But um, you can see here in Matthew 25, 14, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto him them his goods. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Uh, then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So the same type of situation. And you see in the end, uh, for the last guy, verse 24, Matthew 25, 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not straw. Again, a false statement. Same statement in Luke 19. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. So again, he's wicked. Same thing as Luke 19. Thou knewest that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not strong. Um, notice what he says in verse 30. And this wasn't in the Luke 19. He says, 
Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness is a reference to hell because there's weeping and gnashing of teeth there. That's not a good place. If you are in so much pain that your teeth are gnashing together and making a noise out of the pain from that, that's hell fire. That's torment. So my point is, the parable in Luke 19 or in Matthew 25, either one, is not the same as the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3. Because in the Matthew 25 parable, we see that the one who did not serve the Lord, he ends up being thrown into hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But in 1 Corinthians 3, we saw at the judgment seat of Christ in verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3, the one who is unprofitable is not called wicked, and he himself is saved. He still has eternal life. Whereas the one in Matthew 25 or Luke 19, that one who is unprofitable, he is called wicked, which means Christ's blood has not atoned for his sins, or else he wouldn't be wicked. Who you are is who you are in Christ. So he's not in Christ, so he's wicked. And then he's cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he goes to hell, whereas the person who suffers loss in 1 Corinthians 3.15 is saved. He still has eternal life. So that difference right there is enough to tell us that the 1 Corinthians 3 judgment is different from the Luke judgment. Now, they sound similar in that you have 10 cities that you earn for the one who gained the 10 talents, well, or 10 pounds in that case. Uh, and that's because God is doing similar things in Israel's program that he does with the body of Christ. The body of Christ gets eternal life, having their lives hid in Christ, and they are in God's kingdom, and they share God's love forever. We do that in heavenly places. Israel, believing Israel, is also in Christ, having all their sins forgiven, having eternal life in God's kingdom. But they do that on the earth. God has a structure uh, in, on the earth, and he has a structure in heaven. So the more sound doctrine you have in the inner man, the greater your position, whether it's on the earthly kingdom or it's in the heavenly kingdom. So since it's a similar type thing, just in different places, you would expect the, the wording to be very similar between the two judgments. But the difference is that because we receive the atonement the moment we are saved, and Israel has to endure unto the end, that's why we already had the forgiveness of sins, so then we have eternal life in heavenly places. Whereas this one here, this unprofitable servant in Luke 19, apparently did not endure unto the end. He took the mark or worshipped the image of the beast. And so now, not only does he lose a reward, but he himself is not saved because he hasn't been placed into the fire within Christ so that he has survives the fire. But rather, he has to pay for his own sins because he's not been atoned for, because the blood of Christ doesn't atone until the second coming, and he didn't endure unto the end. He took the mark or worshipped the image of the beast. Therefore, he burns in hell fire, whereas the one in 1 Corinthians 3 doesn't. So you can't apply Luke 19 and say that's the same as 1 Corinthians 3, because the end result for the one who is unprofitable is different based upon the difference in when we receive the atonement based upon the two different programs. Okay, um, let's see. So what else do I have here? Um, uh, Rodney does mention that, um, he mentions about in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And he says that grace preachers will use that to say uh, that you have to, that's, that applies somehow to... Uh, to your reward, and uh, I don't remember the details of what he said about that, but basically, yeah, Philippians 2.12. Uh, I never taught that passage that way, 
Um, work out your own salvation of fear and trembling. Rodney brings up is like what Paul did in 1 Corinthians 2 when he came, in verse 3 where he came to them in much fear and trembling because he recognized the uh, high position he had, the responsibility he had as the dispensation of the grace of God committed unto him to share the gospel. And so he had reverence for that position and was making sure that the Corinthians were saved. Um, I agree with what Rodney says on that. I agree. Um, the fear and trembling there has to do with the reverence. Um, but I don't think that's really relevant to the judgment seat of Christ. That's why we really won't get into that detail. Um, now what I wanted to do then is address, if we go to Ephesians chapter 1, because uh, Rodney makes the statement uh, approximately 82 minutes into the message where he says, show me one verse that shows that the body of Christ gets positions of authority in heaven. So uh, I'm going to... Uh, honor Rodney's request and show you one verse that gives you that. Go over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And it says, and what the background that we've already covered in the first hour and a half will go along with this. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says uh, in verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, with the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So verse 18 tells you that what he's talking about is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Uh, and we know that the context is heavenly places because verse 3 in chapter 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So we're talking about heavenly places, and so the inheritance then has to do with heavenly places. And then it says, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ. So according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The context is heavenly places, Verse 21 says, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So he's saying that when God raised Christ from the dead, he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all these things. So that by default tells you then that the structure in heavenly places includes principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. Because if you said something like, well, the president has elected the vice president and set the vice president far above all principality, power, might, dominion. Well, if we're talking about the president of the United States setting up the vice president over the United States, um, then you know that it's talking about the principality, power, might, and dominion of the United States. The subject is the United States, so we must be talking about the power or the structure of the United States. So here when it says he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, mind, and dominion, then that must be a reference to the structure in heavenly places, because that's where he's seated. If I say I put my vice president above all principality, power, and might, we're not talking about he's over the governmental structure and, and Germany, because we're not talking about Germany. The subject is the U.S. If he's the vice president of the U.S., and he's above principalities, then he's above the structure of the U.S. He's not above the structure of Germany. So if this context is that Christ is at the Father's right hand in heavenly places far above this, then that must be a reference to the structure in heavenly places, because that's what the context is tells us. So he's far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet. So he's far above that structure, and he's in charge of everything in heavenly places. And gave him, gave Christ, to be the head over all things to the church. Remember what we read earlier in Colossians 2.20? Colossians, or sorry, Colossians 2.10 Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality, 
and power in whom you are circumcised. You are buried with him in baptism. You are forgiven of your sins. We read in Colossians 3, verse 3, that my life is hid with Christ in God. We've read in verse 1 that Christ sits on the right hand of God. We read in verse 4 that Christ is our life. So when it says he is head of all principality and power, we know from 1 Corinthians 12 that we are his body, the body of Christ. So if he's the head, he's head of all principality and power, and we are the body, then the body must be the principality and power. We must have that structure. And Ephesians 1 confirms that because verse 21 says that Christ in heavenly places is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head, again the head, over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So those verses are telling you that if Christ is the head and we are his body, then we are the fullness of him that fill all in all, meaning that the body of Christ fills all positions in heavenly places that Christ is over that he just talked about. It's just like my body is part of my head. Now, my head makes all my decisions for me, but the body is the fullness of who I really am. The head, the head says, go mow the grass, but my body has to actually do it. My body is the fullness of that. The head can say, go mow the grass all at once. If my body doesn't do it, the grass doesn't get mowed. The body has to perform the instructions of the head. So the body is the fullness of the head. So if Christ, as the head, is set at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power, mind, and dominion, and we are his body, and we are the fullness of him that filleth all in all, then the context demands that the body of Christ fills the positions of principality, power, might, and dominion. So as the head, Christ gives us an instruction. Mow the grass. I know that's not what he's going to say because it's a different system, but for illustration purposes, he says mow the grass. Well, if I've got a paralyzed body, I can't mow the grass. My body, my head can say all at once, that grass is really high. Grass, it has to be mowed. But my body, if it's paralyzed, can't do it. So Christ needs a body that fully functions in the sound doctrine. It gets nourishment ministered from the head, as Colossians 2 talks about. It performs the instructions well. So when it performs the instructions well, Christ says, well, now I've got that body that will fully obey the commandments I give. So then I'm going to take the body of Christ and I'm going to fill those positions, principality, power, might, dominion, with members of the body of Christ to fill all in all so that the whole so that everything works according to the way God wants it to work in Christ in heavenly places. Now, someone may say, well, it didn't specifically say, thus saith the Lord, the body of Christ fills principality, power, might, dominion. 